Hello and welcome to the History of Modern Greece. I'm your host, Daniel Roberts, and I'm here with my father, George, and our theme music is brought to you by Mark Youngerman. This is a podcast that covers the events from the fall of ancient Greece to the modern day. This is episode 16, Spartan Hegemony. So now that Sparta had defeated Athens in the Peloponnesian War, the Delian League was no more. Sparta was in control of Greece and the Aegean Sea. Their goal was to free the Greeks in the Delian League and return things to the way they were before the Persian Wars, which kind of means they're going to put people back into slavery. Now there's an oxymoron. So this meant that the Ionian cities in Anatolia would now return to the Persian Empire. And this, of course, was only carried out because Sparta was receiving all of their funding from the Persians. Which, again, is ridiculous considering their mortal enemy was the Persians and now they're getting all their money from them. This left many Greeks living in Ionia feeling betrayed by Sparta. This contradicted the Spartans' motto of freeing the Greeks, especially since Sparta pledged the Persians that they would not involve themselves in events within Asia Minor. So before this, we had the Delian League. Their motto was, we're going to free all the Greeks in Ionia from the Persian Empire. And then once they defeated the Persians, the Spartans went to war with the Athenians and then made an effort of putting all those freed Greeks right back into Persian hands. In 404 BCE, at the end of the Peloponnesian War, there was an entire generations of Greeks who knew nothing but the bloodiest wars of attrition. This was going to have lasting consequences for Greek society. When the war finally came to an end, there were a lot of soldiers who didn't know what to do. All of their training and workplace experience involved different forms of killing other people, very few which could be translated into farming skills or building skills. And some of these fighters just couldn't let go of the war. These Greeks were the most experienced warriors in their time, and they were able to find work as mercenaries in the east. And because Because Persia had a lot of gold, they were always finding themselves fighting in a war somewhere on the Persian frontier. So now, if you think about it, anyone who's under the age of 30, all they do know is fighting. Whereas anyone who is over the age of maybe, let's say, 50 or 60, they remember the golden age of what Greece was like before the Peloponnesian War. So it's the the image of this ancient Greece and uh, this golden age is starting to become a faded memory and they're only one generation away of all of that identity being lost forever. And just like after the horrors of World War One, all these soldiers came back shell-shocked and it was these people who started World War Two. all these soldiers from the end of the Peloponnesian War, they're All they know is war. All they know is conflict. So of course conflict is going to continue because that's all everybody knows. In 401 BCE, Cyrus, the younger brother to the current king of Persia, hired 10,000 Greeks to march upon his brother and help him seize the throne. He was currently the governor of the western province of the empire, so it was easy for Cyrus to quietly gather his army of 10,000 Greeks and march them across Anatolia. In this march of 10,000 Greeks was a man named Xenophan, and he is our primary source for the accounts of this uh, time era. According to him, the majority of these Greeks were Peloponnesian, and this was an attempt to destabilize Persia. The leader of this army of mercenaries was a Spartan named Clearchus. Clearchus was a tough general and really whipped these assorted Greeks into a serious hoplite army. They met in Sardis, the old capital of the Lydian Empire. Cyrus had informed Clearchus of the plan to invade the Persian Empire and seize the throne from his brother. But that is where the buck stopped. No one else in the Greek army knew that they were going to war with the Persian Empire. They were hired with very great pay to go far into Anatolia to put down a small tribal revolt in Pisidia. So Clearchus marched this giant army of 10,000 hoplites and almost 50,000 Asian troops from the Persian army. When they passed the city of Pisidia and kept on marching into the heart of the Persian Empire, people started to take notice. It wasn't until they made it to Cilicia that the army of Greeks got really angry and started to revolt against their commander. The army demanded that they go no further until they received their full payment owed up to this point. Cyrus was stuck, so he turned to the queen of Cilicia and made a deal with her. She paid all of his troops to keep them from mutinying, and Cyrus would remember her deed, when he is the most powerful and richest man in the world. The army was satisfied, and they continued to march out of Anatolia and into the northwest coast of Syria to the city of Issus. Uh, So one quick thought that uh, I had while listening to this is, Clearchus 
and Cyrus were a little deceptive with the 10,000 Greeks. They never told them what the real plan was or where they were going or how far into the Persian Empire they're going to march. And it appears as though they were worried that they, they might not go if they knew the truth. But in reality, all they cared about was gold. So they really just had to pay them more money and they wouldn't have had any of these problems. When the army arrived in Issus, they were greeted by 700 Spartans. They announced to Cyrus that they were sent to him as a gift from Sparta for aiding them in the war against Athens. Still, the Greeks did not know where they were going, but they knew they had the Spartan king's blessing. From this point, further they were marching into the heartland of the Persian Empire and would be cut off from the Mediterranean Sea. After 12 days of marching through Syria, they came to the famous Euphrates River. The Euphrates was the greatest natural barrier between Syria and Mesopotamia. There was only one bridge that could carry an army this big across, and that was the pontoon bridge in Zugma. However, the Persian king was now aware of this giant army marching towards him and had his general burn the pontoon bridge, trapping Cyrus and his Greek mercenaries on the other side. Unfortunately for the Persian king, it was in the middle of a drought, and the Euphrates was so low that the army, including all of its supply carts and animals, walked right across the river with ease. A little comment here, isn't is it kind of funny how sometimes history can be molded just by some geological or uh, climate thing? Uh, here the river's low, so so much for burning the bridge down. I can only imagine and speculate that uh, the man who burnt down the bridge was super proud of what he just did and figured he just stopped the army, and then the look on his face when he saw the army just continue marching right across the river completely unfazed. For the next 13 days, the army marched south along the Euphrates River, all along knowing the desert they were traveling was the Arabian deserts, and that to the right, just across the river, was an ocean of sand, and the desert tribal people known as the Arabs. After their long trek through the desert, they came across a large wall known as the Median Wall, and this wall stretched from the Euphrates River all the way to the Tigris River, blocking hostile tribes from wandering down from the north, as they were doing now. This wall was completely unguarded as the Persian general fled in fear when he saw the size of Cyrus' army. After marching south of the wall for a while, they crossed a canal which connected the Euphrates to the Tigris, and then they came across a trench signaling the proximity to enemy defenses. A messenger intercepted Cyrus and told him that his brother Artaxerxes was coming and he had an army with him. Artaxerxes' army was many times larger than his younger brothers and although he outnumbered them greatly, Artaxerxes was afraid of the 10,000 hoplites in the army. It was a lifetime ago when the last Persian army faced off against a Greek army. The two armies met outside of Babylon near a city called Kunaxa. When they finally met in battle, Cyrus positioned the Greek hoplites on the banks of the Euphrates River and the rest of his army on the opposite side. Based off of the tales they heard their parents and grandparents talk about the Persians, the Greeks assumed they were going to face an army of barbarians. Instead, this army was extremely disciplined and marched onto the battlefield in complete silence. Their chariot wheels had giant swords fastened to the spokes with blades sticking out of the cart, and these machines were designed to slice right through the bodies of the Greeks, leaving them butchered on the battlefield. While they were facing each other in the battlefield, Cyrus approached the Spartan commander Cleardus and informed him of a new tactic to use against his brother Artaxerxes. Cyrus wanted to pull the hoplites away from the river flank and move them into the center, pitting them against Artaxerxes himself. However, Cleardus refused Cyrus' order and kept his hoplites on the protected edge of the river. But his disobeying of orders really screwed things up for Cyrus. As the Spartan commander led the right flank into battle, they crushed every rank of the Persian soldiers thrown at them. They even made quick work of the scythe chariots by opening their ranks and letting these chariots with Daggers fastened to their wheels just sort of passed right through them without hitting anyone. They just kind of opened up like a sliding door and let the chariots go by and then they closed up their formations again by opening their ranks and letting them pass through. More often than not, the horse would often panic and just kick the chariot riders off. So the chariots, you know, they were all designed in, with good faith 
thinking that they would just go in there and slaughter everyone, but they really wasn't that thought out. But I'm sure before they charged, it really terrified the Greeks. So when these uh, Greek hoplites hit the Persian forces, they hit them so hard that they went right through them. They completely crushed their formations and pushed the Persians back into a full retreat. And before anyone really knew what was going on, the Greeks were almost like a couple miles behind the battlefield, behind the Persians. And yet the main bulk of the Persian army, the center and the right flank, they did not break. They did not retreat with the left flank. They remained where they were. And now the strongest fighters in Cyrus's army, the Greeks, were no longer on the battlefield. In the center rank, Cyrus charged full speed into his brother's cavalry, breaking through the center ranks. Cyrus was so angry that he charged beyond the protection of his army and his 600 bodyguards and went right into the ranks of his brother's army. He even threw a spear wounding Artaxerxes, but he did not kill him. And now, because of his foolishness, Cyrus got himself surrounded by his brother's men, and they quickly got him off his horse and stabbed him to death. And now with Cyrus dead, the entire cause of this war was over, and the battle should have ended. But the Spartans and other Greeks didn't even know Cyrus was dead. They just kept on advancing right through the Persian side of the battlefield, slaughtering every rank and soldier of Persians that they could find. And then the Greeks came across a high hill on the battlefield, and as they took it, they got their first good view of the entire battle. And they watched as cavalry units kicked up dust on the plains below, and as the night fell, the 10,000 Greeks... Almost all of them survived, by the way, slept on the high hill, waiting for morning. So to make matters worse, with the Greeks now far away from their original camp up on a high hill, the Persian army made a dash for the Greek camp and completely raided all of their supplies. So now at this point, the Greeks are stranded in a foreign land without any food, without any gold, surrounded by one of the largest armies in the world, and the man who was paying them is dead. They, they have no reason to be here anymore. Now, normally for the Persians, that would just be like, okay, well, let's go kill all the mercenaries. But unfortunately for them, these mercenaries were the most highly skilled and trained professional killers the world had ever seen, groomed straight out of the Peloponnesian War. When morning came, they got word that their leader Cyrus was dead. Now they were a leaderless army deep within enemy territory. They were still greatly feared by Artaxerxes, and he would never attack them if he didn't have to. But he couldn't just leave them, and the Greeks no longer had any allegiance to Cyrus, because he was dead, so they were free agents. Artaxerxes and Clearchus finally came to an agreement where the Persians would provide food and water and supplies to the Greeks until they reached the Mediterranean, where they would either set up their own city or just continue their journey home. The Persians purposefully led them a different way to avoid any more grief to the Anatolian province of Lydia. So now the Greeks, the 10,000 Greeks, are forced to follow a guide north across the Tigris River and through the mountains of Carduccia. The Persian guides led the 10,000 hoplites to the northern frontier of the Persian Empire, where rugged mountains and wild tribes of barbarians would surely make quick work of the Greek army. It was evident that the Persians were trying to kill every last one of the Greeks. In a movement of treachery, the Persian leader, Tosaphanes, led all of the top Greek generals into a meeting and killed every one of them. And then they killed all their guard and officers waiting outside the tent. One of the Greek officers managed to escape the killing field on his horse, wounded in the belly with a spear, and rode all the way to the Greek camp. There he told the 10,000 Greeks that the Persians had betrayed them, and all of their generals were dead. The Greek hoplites were corralled into the mountains to where the Persians hoped the wild tribes and the harsh winters would kill off the Greek army. While the Greeks sat in the cold mountains of Armenia, leaderless, and with an army of Persians behind them, they held a council and elected five new generals. Xenophon was elected to the position of rear general, so his story of what happened in battle comes from the rear of the army. After traveling through the bitter cold mountains with inadequate clothing, they finally came across the wild tribes of the mountains, the tribes the Persians were hoping would kill them. They were constantly ambushed by these wild tribes, and they would cause rock slides on the trails, killing many Greeks without ever even meeting them in battle. 
Finally, however, the Greeks made it through the mountains in Armenia and descended into another Persian province. As delighted as the Greeks were to see civilization again, they came across another Persian army, waiting for them to come out of the mountains. And just as the Greek army halted in front of the menacing Persian army, blocking the valleys of Armenia, and the Carduchian mountain tribes advanced on the rear of the Greek army. In a crazy maneuver, the Greeks managed to cross the river and steam behind the Persian army into Armenia. After months of marching through the Armenian mountains, the Greeks made it to the Black Sea. Now because Xenophon marched in the back, his description of the events was he heard Greeks screaming from the top of the hill. And this terrified a lot of the Greeks. And when, they, when the next rank of Greeks made it to the top of the hill, they started shouting. And then from the rear guard of the army, it looked like they were facing an even greater Persian army. But what he quickly realized as he made it to the top of the hill, it wasn't Greeks screaming. They were cheering and applauding because they had made it to the Black Sea. And with the Black Sea, they now had a direct route back through Byzantium and into Greek territory. Now there is one quick thing I do want to mention here is the mountains that Artaxerxes led the Greeks into was a little part of his territory that he had never conquered. So these were wild mountains right in the heart of the Persian Empire in modern day northern Iran and Iraq. And despite the greatness of the Persian army, they were never able to subdue this area. So there's this tiny little mountain range inside the Persian Empire is completely independent and isolated. So as Artaxerxes pushed the Greeks into there, and he knew that they were going to have to pass the mountains, he just had his army march around to the other side of the mountains and was hoping to kill whatever Greeks survived this trek through the mountains. Unfortunately for him, they all survived, or a good portion of them did. But uh, the significance of this is, this is kind of like a little province within the empire that is completely independent that the Persians were just never able to conquer. So a little comment about this uh, long hike they did. Uh, we were watching a video on it and they showed with maps that uh, it was a distance of about 1,500 miles. So uh, wherever you're listening from, like I'm from the Vancouver area, that'd be like marching the army all the way through the Rocky Mountains to Winnipeg. <laughs> it's, it's remarkable. That's a really long march with you know, armor and lack of food and so forth. It's, that, was, that was quite a feat they did. So when you think of the March of the 10,000, there are uh, several different instances in history that come to mind. Uh, one of them, which we'll talk about really soon, is Alexander the Great. He almost took the exact same route that the 10,000 Greeks took. And another march, which will happen 1,400 years later was the first crusade. They took a lot of these same routes as well. They, you know, just another giant army marching through foreign land, hoping that they make it and hoping they don't run out of food. In 400 BC, when the Greek army finally made it back home, they reported everything that had happened to the Spartan king Agacellus II. The king of Sparta, on the advice of his commander Lysander from the Peloponnesian War, decides to go against the treaty he signed with the Persians and sends an army into Anatolia. He is downright pissed off at what these Greek hoplites are telling him. He sends a small fleet of ships to the Ionians, but nothing really happens from this event. Some background information on King Agacellus II. He was a younger son of the Spartan king during the Peloponnesian War and was never expected to ascend to the throne. But his older brother was considered suspect because Alcibiades slept with his mum. While the king was away on campaign, if you remember that story in the previous uh, episodes, to make matters worse, Agacellus was born with one leg shorter than the other, and had he not been royalty, would have been discarded off the cliffs during his infancy inspection. Because he was never expected to be king, Agacellus went through the rigorous training of the Spartans. So Agacellus really redeemed himself by completing the training and shortly afterwards became Spartan king. So in, in 396 BCE, the Spartan king Agesilaus II personally led an army into Asia Minor, or Anatolia, to quote-unquote free the Ionian Greeks from the Persians. Which is funny because only a few years ago they were liberating them from the Athenians into the hands of the Persians. 
Now, responding to the sudden invasion of Spartans into Anatolia and only a few years after the march of the 10,000 hoplites through central Persia, the king of kings, Artaxerxes, started to take notice of the new Spartan threat. And Artaxerxes knew he had to come up with a plan. In 395 BCE, the Persians started to look at ways of disrupting the growing threat that was Sparta. So they opened talks with all the other Greek city-states. And with a little persuasion and a good old-fashioned bribery, the Persians convinced the Greek city-states to rebel against the Spartan hegemony. Now this isn't a small amount of gold. Persia built entire fleets for these Greek city-states and made sure that each city-state got richer than Sparta and only in a few transactions. Now these main city-states were Corinth, Thebes, Athens, and Argos. And they took this new fleet and their new wealth, and of course, they rebelled against the Spartans. Now at home, the situation got so bad for the Spartan king Agesilaus II that he was forced to cancel his campaign in Anatolia and return home. Which is kind of funny too, because he went on a campaign into Anatolia to free the Greeks only to realize that all the other Greeks back home were now attacking his place and this is all because the Persians were just dumping money on them it's a uh, it's quite a mess it sure goes to show where the loyalty is money <laughs> Persia really messed things up in Greece now this ultimately led to a major war between Corinth and Sparta which was a total shocker to everyone living at the time because Corinth and Sparta were really close allies, especially during the Peloponnesian War. And within a few years, they completely betrayed him. Now, one thing I do also want to note, and I know I just covered this, is the fact that the Persians were creating all these Greek fleets. So think about it. The Spartan fleet that defeated the Athenians was created with Persian gold. And then when the Spartans became too powerful, they attacked the Persians. So the Persians, knowing that the Spartans were too powerful, they gave all this gold to their enemies. So the Persians know that they have to keep these Greek city-states wealthy enough that they'll attack each other, but they don't want one city-state to become too wealthy because then they'll attack the Persians. So it's a very dangerous balancing game feeding money and power into these different Greek city-states and forcing them to plot against each other. It was like a brilliant move of chess. But the whole time, Persia knew a united Greece means the end of Persia. So they were doing everything they could to stop it. Ultimately, it was Thebes who made the move against the Spartans. They needed an excuse to break the treaty between Thebes and Sparta. So Thebes used its newfound wealth to stir the pot between two smaller, less relevant Greek city-states, Oslocris and Phocis. This small dispute over land and taxes was enough commotion for the Thebes to involve themselves. As soon as Thebes stepped into the small dispute, it triggered the smaller state to call upon the Spartans. This is how a tiny local dispute triggered a massive war, because now Thebes could go to Athens and Argos. Just like that, the Peloponnesian War was reignited. Now an army of Spartans marched across the Peloponnese and into Boeotia. Thebes is the polis of Boeotia. A second army of Spartans, led by Lysander himself, marched upon Thebes from the city of Phocis. The original plan was for these two armies to link up before marching on Thebes. However, Lysander didn't want to wait and instead marched his army to a small Boeotian city called Hiliardus and started to lay siege. Thebes responded by sending their forces to defend their neighbors from the Spartans and Lysander. So now we're at the Battle of Haliartus, and this was an epic disaster for the Spartans. Their army was camped outside of the walls of Haliartus when the entire Theban army came marching over the hill. Now the Spartan army was trapped between the city walls and the Theban spears, and the entire Spartan army was cut down, including the Spartan king Lysander himself. And none of this would have happened had Lysander not wanted to hog all the glory for himself and just waited for his backup army to arrive. Now, a few days after the slaughter, the rest of the Spartan army arrived at the scene and, and they were shocked to see that their fellow army completely slaughtered, including the late King Lysander. And they set up an offensive position against the Theban army. But now the tables had turned and the Thebes were outnumbered. But shortly after that, the Athenians showed up with their army. And then another face-off kind of began as 
All the allies kind of arrived at the battlefield. Each side dug in and prepared for an all-out war between the Greek hoplites. They were very close to entering another bloody battle. But at the last moment, a truce was called so the Spartans could collect their dead, including the body of King Lysander. These men needed a proper funeral if they were to send their souls to the underworld. Now, to us, this seems silly, but you know, in Greek culture, that was like one of the most significant things ever. All armies would always allow the dead to be collected so they could be properly buried in order for them to properly transition to the underworld. This was a very big thing in uh, Homer's Iliad, where King Priam regained the body of Hector and then gave him a proper burial. So this is this is kind of instilled into Greek legend and culture. This made perfect sense to everyone at the scene, and all parties agreed to the truce. And eventually, once all the bodies were collected, cool heads prevailed, and eventually all armies went home. So it wasn't a full outbreak of war yet. Meanwhile though, back in Anatolia, King Agesilaus II was making a lot of progress in his campaigns against the Persians. And he was very successful at gathering allies living in Anatolia who joined his army. And he grew his forces bigger and bigger with every city he took. He has his adventures in Asia Minor, but he thinks he's on the verge of a total takeover of Persian territory. His campaign is going well, but then he is sent word of what is happening back at home and he is forced to cut his military conquest of Persian Anatolia short and then go home and put out all the fires that are brewing there. Now this is the exact result Persia was hoping to gain by financing Thebes and Corinth in the first place. So think about it. You know, had the Persians not done this and given all this money to Spartans adversaries, it could have been King Agesilaus II who conquered the entire Persian Empire, and maybe he would have done it better than Alexander. So it was, it was kind of always the plan to just conquer the Persians. But this time the Persians won, and the Spartans definitely lost. In 394 BCE, Agesilaus II returned home from Anatolia. By this time, he is well aware that his neighbors are backed by Persian gold. There's no secret. The two coalitions gathered their forces and marched into battle. The Spartans and their allies met the Boeotians, their allies, in the city of Nemea. When the two armies met each other in a classical hoplite battle, the Spartans are placed on the right of their army and they crushed the Athenians posing them. Simultaneously, their left flank was crushed by Thebes. So the two lines end up doing a swirl. Now the Theban hoplites and the Spartan hoplites were facing each other with their fallen comrades scattered along the battlefield. The Spartans slaughtered the Thebes and proved once again that the Spartans were the best at hoplite warfare. In this entire battle, the Spartans lost only eight men. That's, that's amazing. Sure, thousands were stabbed or cut with spears, but they were mere flesh wounds for the Spartans. The Spartans continued their march past Nemea and tried to cross the narrow strait and the city of Corinth. But here they met more resistance the walls of Corinth were too big for the Spartans to penetrate, so they took to the sea. However, the Spartan fleet was no longer the top dog, and the Greek city-states brought all of their Persian-funded ships to sea and intercepted the Spartans. At first, the Spartans were doing really well and had the Greek alliance on the edge of defeat. When the Persian fleet arrived and encapsulated the Spartan fleet, several Spartans beached their vessels to escape the Persian ships. Not a single Spartan ship survived this naval battle, Canidus, and the Spartan fleet ceased to exist after this date. Just after landing in Greece and marching into Boeotia, King Agesilaus II and his army meet the Theban armies and their allies. When the two armies met, like every other battle it seems, the strongest Greeks stood in the right flank of the phalanx. As soon as the battle started, the Thebes started to let out a war cry, and the cowardly left rank started to flee. So the Spartans chased a bunch of Argives as they ran away from the battlefield, and on the other side of the fight, the Thebes sprinted right through the Orchomenians. So now the Spartans Spartans think they won the war because they stormed right through the army, not even aware that the Thebans had done the same thing to them. The Thebans were just as confused, except they found themselves in the middle of the Spartan supply carts. When the two armies turned around and faced each other, the Thebans saw who they were facing and decided to retreat. However, King Agesilaus II was not about to let the Thebans escape without punishment, so he forced another charge on the Thebans and cut down almost 
every man in their army. So this is the most dangerous and deadly time to be a soldier is while you're retreating. Uh, you're disorganized, you're, you're, you're not adequately defended, uh, your, your partner's not defending you, you're not, partner, you're not defending him, you're just, you're just running away. So you're an easy target for someone who is organized and they're after you. In 393 BCE, the Allies had the Spartans trapped in the Peloponnese. So they decided to make the city-state of Corinth the headquarters for all of the Allied armies. And this meant that they would keep Sparta bottled up and they would control the raids into their territory as they saw fit. This also meant that Corinth was going to be the main battlefield for this war, hence the name, the Corinthian War. In 392 BCE, the Spartans launched a surprise night raid on the city of Lycaeum. Lycaeum is the port city of Corinth, and ironically has a series of walls surrounding the port city, and follow a paved road that leads directly to Corinth. Now. If this sounds familiar, it's because it is a replica of the long walls of Athens from the Peloponnesian War. And in a long-pitched battle, the Spartans became victorious and ended up tearing down a couple sections of the Corinthian long wall. Meanwhile, at sea, while the Persian fleet is sailing back to Asia Minor, the Athenian commander Conan requests the Persians leave the fleet with the Athenians. This would give Athens control over the Aegean, allow them to derail Spartan interests elsewhere. Not only did Conan convince the Persians it was in their best interest to give their fleet to the Athenians, but they also agreed to fund the reconstruction of the Long Walls. This led to the reconstruction of the Athenian Empire and begins the era that some historians refer to as the Second Athenian Empire. In 391 BCE, a new breed of soldier was unleashed on the battlefield, and these men were called the Peltast. They were very light infantry and threw spears. They threw them hard and fast and were extremely deadly at short to medium range. They could pick off soldiers in a phalanx without ever getting close enough to be harmed and they weren't anything as light or as clumsy as an arrow. These peltas could throw a spear right through a Spartan shield, pinning their arms to the bronze shield. The general Iphicrates unleashed these new peltas against the Spartan hoplites and had amazing success. In fact, they frightened off most hoplites. Not the Spartans though, they were too disciplined. In 390 BCE, Sparta faced off against an Athenian army in the Battle of Lechium. In this battle, the Spartans had the Athenians on the move, but they continued to retreat while the Peltas hurled javelins at them. The Spartans would attack and then get pelted by spears and fall back. Then they would mount another charge, get pelted by more spears, and then fall back. This happened several times without the Spartans ever getting into a close quarter battle where they become an unstoppable cutting machine. Finally, the Spartans started to lose significant numbers and their energy started to fade. That is when the Athenians sent in their fresh hoplites. It was a slaughter, and the Spartans had to fall back. They retreated to the ships of the harbor. The entire time, the Peltas were pursuing them and throwing spears at them. When the Spartan allies saw them running away from their enemy, they broke ranks and fled the battlefield. Once the battle was over and the Spartans went home, the Argives marched into Corinth. The army from Argos stormed the city and captured the Acropolis. After this conquest, the two city-states merged into one unified polis. The stone walls between the two cities were torn down. There are two working theories on what year this merger happened. One scholar argues that the Union of Corinth and Argos occurred in 392 BC and others who believe it happened in 390 BC. Close enough. Well, that's it for today. Join us next time on the History of Modern Greece. See you next time. Stay safe and stay awesome.